Hi, this is Cece Kim. And this is Jim Bacho. And this is Movies About Music. And what movie did we watch? Uh, we just finished watching Hustle and Flow. Yes, we did. This is a first for our podcast mm-hmm. because neither of us has seen this movie. Mm-hmm. I hadn't even really heard about it either. I had heard about it and I had it in my mind for this podcast. Okay. I'm trying to remember what year is this movie? It was 2005. 2005. I'm trying to think of what I was doing in my life then. I was living in San Francisco. Uh I was being a professional musician, actually. Oh, that's right. And doing wedding gigs and bar mitzvahs and clubs in San Francisco and San Jose. And I was also doing magazine writing. And during that time, I was also doing audio for video stuff for a production Mm. facility. What were you doing in 2005? I was still in university. Mm -hmm. And I was actually, that was a year that I was singing a lot of hooks for rappers and their demos, their mixtapes, actually. So this kind of brought me back. I'm very familiar with that process. Yeah. And a lot of people back then had mixtapes. I mean, the mixtape thing goes back years. Mm -hmm. I remember making mixtapes in high school. The mixtape in hip hop is not a literal mixtape like you make for your girlfriend in junior high. Okay. It's a very specific concept that I think you're not familiar with. Yeah, I think of it as a cassette tape. It is. It could be a literal cassette tape. But even now, um, certain artists, they call their albums mixtapes. And I think... The origin, I'm not entirely sure, but from what I remember, it's basically the album of an unsigned artist. Ah. I remember being in New York in like 2004. I spent the summer in New York and everybody was on the streets trying to hustle their CDs, right? Right. Say, hey, this is my mixtape. Check it out. And you Uh bought it for like $10 or $5 or $15 or whatever. And this was sort of like the MySpace era where Mm -hmm. you could discover music on MySpace. And then artists like sort of had their music, you know, consumed that way. But then you couldn't buy the music because, you know, yeah, there was like LimeWire and all that. (laughs) But artists who only had CDs, who, who, you know, if you say, oh, I I just cut a Mm mixtape, it means that you went into a, you know, studio like that. And you cut a CD, right? Okay. And it wasn't online for downloading. You can't sell it otherwise. You, you had to sell it in the form of a CD or a tape. That's where the concept of a mixtape comes from. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And so even now, certain hip hop artists, they call their albums mixtapes. Okay. See, for me, mixtape just means that thing of, you know, you, you make a mix of songs off of your library for your for your girlfriend or your boyfriend or your buddy. (laughs) And then what you're talking about, we call it recording. Way back, like we would um, do everything on four track. Mm -hmm. So the four track was a big deal um, Mm -hmm. and you would do it that way. But we never called it a mixtape. So that's interesting. That's kind of appropriating the term for um, a different kind of thing that Mm. I had no idea about. Now, we should probably preface this episode by saying that there's probably going to be a lot of Jim doesn't know what he's talking about in this episode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I don't follow <laughs> hip hop at all. Mm-hmm. I've never really gotten into hip hop. I mean, when I was a kid, me and my best friend at the time, Marcus, we would listen to like Run DMC was starting to happen. And before that, like Grandmaster Flash. <laughs> and we would listen to Rapper's Delight, <laughs> you know. And But these were great. I mean, it was totally, great. It was yeah, yeah. fun. And as a kid, you're, it was really, hip hop was really fun fun music and then when i started becoming serious about music Mm -hmm. for me gen x many white dudes i guess Mm -hmm. gained this attitude about hip-hop that it was um, Mm, non-musical um because it it didn't you didn't have to learn an instrument and you didn't have to you know it was it was sort of different from the thing of learning an instrument joining a band you know you've got two guitar Mm -hmm. players so one of you is going to have to play bass and learn to play Mm -hmm. the bass and then you jam on some songs in the garage. Right. And then you record them to a four track. But then in, in hip hop, you know, it's, I mean, obviously it comes from a completely different culture. It's a completely different attitude, completely different form of expression mm. that in my world, it, it didn't really appeal to me. To me, it always seemed very kind of non-melodic, mm-hmm. very automated and very robotic. And I still have kind of some of these attitudes about hip hop. I just want to be kind of open to the mm-hmm. listeners that it, it's not my style of music. That said, I love movies about hip hop. I, mm-hmm. I For some yeah. reason, I really, you know, like a movie like this, a movie like Hustle and Flow, you know, it seems to come out of this, you know, this kind of genuine situation mm-hmm. or setting. 
mm. um, where someone has something to express. Mm. And then, you know, you it's the same thing as kids learning instruments, except you're not learning instruments. Mm. But you're getting together and something's happening, mm-hmm. which is really the cool thing about mm-hmm. music and the cool thing about art, when all of a sudden something's just happening mm-hmm. and something cool is taking place, which is really what this movie captures really well. Totally, yeah. So what had you heard about this movie? I just knew that it was um, Terrence Howard, who I guess I have a bit of a man crush on. Mm, okay, yeah. Um, we, you know, we sort of... We saw Terrence Howard. We discussed oh, Terrence yeah, Howard Holland's last time. Oh, yeah, Mr. Holland's Opus. He was, there was, he was a young he was Terrence kid. Howard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know you had a weird man crush on him, though. I don't know if it's weird. I guess we could... <laughs> <laughs> I, okay, so I use weird as an adjective a yes. lot yeah. <laughs> for no reason. <laughs> no, but uh, I suppose to, for your husband to say that he has a, uh, a <laughs> man crush. Fine. Totally fine. Okay. You have a lot of man crushes, though, like Uh-oh. lots of NBA players. Oh, uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah. Uh, Kelly Oubre is a very good looking man. <laughs> yeah. And he was a warrior for a brief period of time. So I was and Malcolm for X. Oh, they're Malcolm all like, X is, they're a, all like is a beautiful man. man. It's really oh, that's true, isn't it? <laughs> hmm. Yeah, maybe I have a thing for black men. <laughs> Sorry, but I just, it was just an observation. All of a sudden, I like remembered all the man crushes. I feel like I'm in therapy all of a sudden. Um, never mind. Mm-hmm. Terrence Howard, for me, is so terrifying. There's something in his eyes yeah. that communicates. I mean, he's a, t- I, I feel the same way about him as I feel towards Denzel Washington. They, they play toxic men so well. I mean, he's very intense in this movie. Mm-hmm. Do you want to get into what you mean by. So this is Terrence Howard, the lead character in Hustle and Flow. Mm -hmm. DJ is his Mm -hmm. character name. In what sense is he... I mean, obviously it's obvious in the movie, but maybe you could talk about what makes his character toxic. I think that this movie, this story would have been told in a very different way now, but in 2005. So I feel like I have some sort of authority over this issue because I'm an elder millennial and I lived the Y2K in the early 2000s era mm-hmm. as a late teen and an early 20s woman. Looking back, a lot of us now realize how misogynistic and toxic of an environment, of an era that was for all of us. It was sort of like we kind of set ourselves back. Mm-hmm. And that movie, and I felt that. This movie took me back to all of that. Well, this was the other thing. Uh, I don't want to derail you there, but this was another thing that I didn't like about hip hop. There were two predominant themes when I would watch it on MTV. Mm. Money and, mm-hmm. and wealth mm-hmm. and the accumulation of money and this kind of misogynistic attitude that seemed to somehow uh, people seem to just not acknowledge. Absolutely. And this is being reexamined now. Retrospectively. Yeah, yeah that retrospect- makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And, and in the hip hop scene. Yeah, And especially by women my age and the young women now, because they're like, well, what were you guys thinking going along with this? Because we voluntarily objectified ourselves so much back then. And it was very common for these stories about, you know, people just casually beating their girlfriends and their wives and like, you know, being violent, whatever, selling their girlfriends into prostitution, sort of like, you know. Those stories were being told very casually in music and in movies and, you know, TV shows and whatnot. Like Jay-Z, Snoop Dogg, they all talked about pimping. I don't know if they were actual pimps ever in real life, (laughs) but they were always rapping about pimping. And there were jokes, you know, that were made casually at like a frat house level. (laughs) Mm. And so that culture and that mentality was like, very prevalent. It started off as a joke. Obviously, everybody's joking, right? Like, no fraternity boy actually believes that he's a pimp. But these things kind of, like, seep into our our lives. Well, that brings up a couple of questions. Mm-hmm. One, do you know why women were going along with this? Well, I... Or in your In, in your my case, sense. I remember exactly why. Um, it was because at that age, male approval was everything to me. Like, Mm -hmm. I thought that that was my entire existence, to be really honest. I think the young women nowadays are very different. But back then, I remember thinking, you know, if I can get this guy's attention, like, you know, I'll be like this kind of girl and like, you know, desirability as a young woman. And men will treat you very differently if they find you attractive. Oh, it's true. And that was sort of like to make that very obvious 
to, for men to have authority over women, right? And, mm. and like get a say on like who they get to treat better because they find attractive. That thing was very, it was very strong back in the day when I was younger. I think a lot of younger women now are just like, fuck off. <laughs> mm-hmm. When I was younger, like 2005, I was in a very heteronormative, like cisgendered sort of culture, right? And it was very homophobic, openly homophobic. A lot That's of hip hop. It was a lot of hip hop was openly homophobic. It was a strange time, and I I still can't wrap my head around it. Mm-hmm. I think it was because the only way we could survive was to go with this. Uh, Ludacris was in this movie. He said something was like, he "Yeah, skinny he was black? skinny black." Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think in one of his songs says a uh, lady in the streets freak in the sheets right so that kind of thing pretty good line <laughs> yeah that kind of thing was so prevalent like you had to be yeah. so perfect and then us millennials were very much into pleasing people you know well was there kind of a sense of almost like there's a there's a power element to it as well Absolutely, right and, yeah. and there's a certain glamour to the lifestyle yeah. and things like that yeah and then just these very bold personalities, mm-hmm. right? Is is that an element of it too? That, that, Absolutely. That, that yeah. must be very attractive. Yeah, and it's attractive. And then they, back then they had this video vixen thing, which is like girls who are exclusively in rap videos. Like they're in all the rap videos. Oh, wow. And they're in a thong and they're shaking their ass, right? That was an actual occupation back then. And they made a lot of money. They usually married um, rappers or, you know, ballers, like basketball players, and they live very good lives. So being attractive, being, you know, a commodity, that was very much the message that I had received since the late 90s, specifically. Mm -hmm. And then so that bled into like the early 2000s. And 2005 was sort of the peak of this kind of thing. Southern hip hop became like really popular all of a sudden. Okay, so we should maybe right. um, set up the the film a little bit because mm-hmm. what you're talking about is first of all the things you're talking about mm-hmm. right now are mm-hmm. very evident in the film. Everything yeah. that you've just mm-hmm. said, I think. And then you and I, while we were watching the movie, the whole time we're trying to figure out where this movie right. was taking place mm-hmm. because it felt kind of like Compton, but. You know, all of the kind of symbols along the way, the food on the table Mm -hmm. was very Southern. Mm -hmm. Everybody was sweating constantly. (laughs) Uh, And there was this awesome Middle South Uh kind of drawl going on. Yeah. Uh, We eventually figured out they're from Memphis. Right. Tell us about this um, Southern hip hop that was going on. Well, I'm not an expert on anything crunk whatsoever. But but you know more than me. Yes, I do. And so So it would be like a way of easing us into laughable for me to explain this to you because I don't know what, what. I'm really talking about but all I can say is the popularity of this specific kind of southern hip-hop and they used to call it crunk I think it's very raw Mm -hmm. and they get into it in the movie like it's a hard raw kind of hip-hop I feel like it's a bit dumbed down because like I'm an east coast kind of person who Mm -hmm. like I listen to like Tribe Called Quest and like you know like Notorious B.I.G. you know I like the smooth like sort of like jazz is kind of incorporated into Mm -hmm. the hip hop that I listen to so like for me like this music sounded really dumb to me at the time Mm -hmm. like it and they were talking about stuff that I had no idea what the fuck they were talking about like pimps and hoes and bitches and you know like shooting guns and like you know like whatever like people were in and out of jail and these rappers were actually in and out of jail getting shot and stuff like that and so we would see that as a lifestyle that coincided with the lyrics right so it was authentic right so that's the thing i think that even goes back before this time i Mm -hmm. mean that the idea that it was authentic that it was coming from a very real place so terrence howard's character dj is a pimp Mm -hmm. and a drug dealer yeah well he weed yeah it's that, that was that a drug just, back then yeah, yeah so yeah I, I thought the weed thing was interesting because you know r- right now it would be like i don't know pills or something that's fentanyl probably, yeah yeah exactly <laughs> so it was just weed which seems funny today yeah, yeah and he's um got something that he wants to say he the whole thing is i've you know i've got something that i want to put out there mm-hmm. just to set up the plot a little bit there's a guy who owes him some money or something and mm-hmm. he's got an old casio keyboard mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a battery powered thing. And I used to have one of those when I was a kid mm-hmm. and and I would play Berlin's Riding on the Metro. A very dated <laughs> reference. But uh, I used to have one of those Casio keyboards. They're really cool. You could do like little chords with them and you uh-huh. can uh, do basic kind of beats with them. Yeah. 
And so he gets that and he takes it home and um, he starts messing with it. And then he runs into an old buddy of his at the at the mm-hmm. convenience store who turns out is doing audio engineering for the church. Mm-hmm. And then there's this great scene and it's one of those just brilliant schooled actor that Terrence Howard is mm-hmm. scenes. He's recording this woman and this choir singing a song about Jesus mm-hmm. in the church. And she's just gorgeous. And, you know, the camera does this kind of slow pull in mm-hmm. on him and tears come down his face. And yeah. I think it's safe to say that's a moment. And then you realize that there's something, you know, there's some passion in this guy. And he's not mm-hmm. just a drug dealer and a pimp. And he wants to do some music. And that's really where things kick off. That's mm-hmm. kind of like the inciting incident, I guess, seeing this woman sing in the yeah. church. Yeah. There you've got what I think is something that's authentic to hip hop. I mean, again, forgive me if I don't know what I'm talking about. But the idea of having something to express, it's very real to your world. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think that's basically you summed up hip-hop and why it means so much to a lot of people in one sentence. And this is coming from a guy who doesn't know anything about me. But well, it yeah, was around was all the very, time, you know. It was yeah. like, for me growing up, just as like for you, it was it was around all the time. Mm-hmm. So I was aware of, I was aware of the press, you mm-hmm. know, how the press would cover it. And you're like the same age as these legendary rappers. Like I think Tupac and Biggie were around your age. They're yeah, they're maybe, both they might be a little bit older. They're both but, dead. Yeah, I know they're both dead. But... <laughs> why are we laughing about that? No, because... You, <laughs> I know this is your because I know something. something. Yeah. <laughs> but they're around your age, I think. And that was that was big news. Um, yeah. So you kind of were probably like, ah, oh, this shit again. <laughs> it, for me, it was like, why is this all this coverage about people killing each other? And mm-hmm. and I, you know, I don't want to sound ignorant. I know what was going on. You know, I grew up like reading about the the crack epidemic mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and um, the problems of crime, and you know, the whole feeling trapped in your world yeah. and not having this bootstraps path to get out, mm-hmm. right? Um, and this sort of self-perpetuating cycle mm-hmm. that happens um, in inner cities. And But at the same time, it felt like there was kind of this glorification of something. Mm-hmm. To me, it didn't have anything to do with music. There were, there were two ways to get out of the so-called the proverbial hood, right? You either become a baller or a rapper. Okay. So I think the glorification of the money means that much because it is so impossible to get out of that situation. It's a superhuman feat to achieve, and that is why it's so glorified. The money and, you know, all of it that comes with it. It's like, if you can make it there, it gives hope to the community. I think there's something about the glorification of the money is part of the culture because of where it comes from and what it takes to get there. I understand that, but that it wasn't really expressed that way. It was expressed as a kind of a ha-ha, look at my money. Totally. And I think they're not even conscious of this, what I'm saying. Like, you mm-hmm. know, I, I heard this from an actual, like a, a hip-hop scholar, if anything. Well, good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's at a conscious level whatsoever, but I think it's a huge part of the glorification is because of where they came from and how difficult life is and how the system is working against them. Mm -hmm. And these people become heroes. And and there's also this, like, a lot of this talk about when when Skinny Black came home, Ludacris, he came home. Set it up a little bit. Yeah, so... There's this rapper figure who made it, right, who comes from that neighborhood, who's from Memphis. DJ and this person grew up in the same neighborhood, but they didn't go to the same school. They went to two different schools, which was mentioned a lot. And so he doesn't actually know him very well, but he knows of him. And he feels close to Skinny Black. DJ feels close to Skinny Black. The community feels like he's one of them. And the reason his music was so, like his very first um, mixtape was so good was because it was made in that community without the record producers and the executives telling him to make a hit or whatever. It was like a raw product of his upbringing and the community and the culture that he grew up in. And then he kind of like falls out, like he becomes a star. And then I think like his music becomes flat and boring. Ludacris is so corny. So it kind of like for me, it was very hard to believe. It was not very good casting. Yeah, I was like... That was not good casting. (laughs) And I didn't know it was Ludacris. I've heard of Ludacris. I've never listened to any of his music, but he was not a very good actor. I mean, Luda is so Luda. Like, he's so ludicrous. Like, you can't escape. Like, he can't be anything else. And his voice is so iconic in a bad way. (laughs) He's like, he is 
the voice of the frat parties, you know, like for me. Okay. <laughs> and so it was really distracting to see him in that role. So there's this theme of like coming home. We missed you. Right. He, he keeps saying that, right? Right. Everybody keeps saying like, hey, c- welcome home. And just to build on that a little bit, I think one of the things you're suggesting is that the mixtape mm-hmm. speaks to them at a very intimate level. Right, right. So it's so the idea of coming home or you've lost your way mm-hmm. just shows how close mm-hmm. this music meant to people. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And that I think in the hip hop community is like in different hip hop communities because there's no not one hip hop community right. obviously. For a lot of hip hop fans, part of the appeal is that these people are talking about real things that pertain to them and their lives mm-hmm. and they mention actual places that they know about. They mention things that they are living. Right. Okay. It's always been sort of like the spirit of hip hop. I don't know what the hell's going on in rap now. <laughs> I have no idea. I, I don't listen to rap anymore. But that, to me, like growing up, that was sort of like what it was all about. You know, I, I didn't grow up in any of these communities, obviously, but it's sort of a window into how other people live. Yeah. Yeah. It's good storytelling. In 2005, I was getting my master's degree, or I was hmm. just finished my master's degree, and I studied critical theory and culture studies. Mm-hmm. And, and in this type of program, we deal with this idea of you can't put art in a state of a museum. Right. You have to bring it down to the people. You have to take it out of the museum and bring it to the people. Mm-hmm. And this is done through cultural theorists like Raymond Williams and people like this, where things come down to the street level. Mm -hmm. And you saw this kind of play out a little bit in the movie Exit Through the Gift Shop. Have you seen Mm -hmm. that? Yeah, yeah. It's the idea of rather than music being something that's done at this kind of pristine level, Mm -hmm. with hip hop, it was from real people. Mm -hmm. So this opens a debate in critical theory Mm -hmm. and cultural studies about what music means. Do you have to be an expert craftsman? Mm -hmm. Do you have to go through the training and all of this sort of thing? in order to express art or is art expressed can it be expressed by anyone mm. this is an unresolved debate in really? in cultural studies yeah okay because it sounds pretty obvious to me well it's not obvious to me because uh, either side you can make an argument okay but well, what would be your response to that that anybody can express art but then the problem with that is that if anybody can express art, then what is art? What is what is the excellence? What is the because that would overthrow the whole idea of the Greek concept of art and beauty as as mm-hmm. skilled as techne as you know developing a technique and really becoming an expert craftsman aiming towards being Michelangelo or mm-hmm. or someone like that. If anybody can do it, then it just kind of washes out art and mm-hmm. and I think. In a sense, one can make an argument. I'm not making this argument, but it is something I think about. Whether that aspect of cultural studies is won out, Mm. and now everything is kind of anybody gets to have their say. Yeah. And is that a good thing? I don't want to make a value judgment on that. That's th- th- yeah. See, this is why in, in, in all of this, I don't think you need to decide one mm-hmm. way or another. It's mm-hmm. just the discussion that's going mm-hmm. on. You know, hip hop was a part of this. Graffiti art was a part of mm-hmm. this. So that people who are not invited to the museum, mm-hmm. who are not able to go to the museum, that were celebrating the lives of real people mm-hmm. who are living difficult lives. There, I think the virtue is real. Mm-hmm. I know like world renowned graffiti artists and I know rappers. I know hip hop artists. And I'm telling you, it is not easy. Not anybody can do it. Like it's really hard to rap on the beat. It is really hard to spit. It is really hard to flow. It is very hard to produce a wall of graffiti art. Mm-hmm. Oh, that graf- is, graffiti yeah. art is oh, incredible. Lots of training, lots of toiling, like developing your style. You, it, you know, it's illegal, so you got to find a place to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, so let's situate the movie with all of mm-hmm. this. It was interesting. He, you know, he gets the engineer. Yeah. And then comes this white dude. Uh-huh. I don't know the actor's name. Do you remember the character's name? I know the actor's name is DJ something. Oh, really? Yeah. His, he's a, an actual... I don't know if he's an actual DJ, but he's like a weird looking person. He's been in a bunch of stuff. He's been in a bunch of stuff and he's a weird looking skinny white, white dude. White kid. Yeah. yeah. And he comes along and he brings his MPC yeah. uh, drum machine and his keyboards. And so he's making a lot of the sounds. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting in the scenes when they're actually creating music Mm -hmm. to see him and the engineer sort of setting things up. And then the thing that was interesting to me is that DJ has no idea what's going on. 
He's just ready to spit out his words. Yeah. But then he's got a natural rhythm for. I mean, mm-hmm. I know enough about hip hop to know that mm-hmm. it's a very rhythmic thing with words. I mean, some of the rappers that I do like have a cadence and have a have a rhythm and do interesting things with their mm-hmm. voices rhythmically. I don't know if this was an accident, but early on he was way behind the beat. I don't know if you noticed. This. I totally noticed. I was like, "What the hell's going on?" Yeah. <laughs> And then later on, he was on the beat, yeah. and he was really good. It was a very realistic portrayal of what happens when somebody claims that they can rap. Well, so that's yeah. the thing. So this is him pushing it, yeah. right? Yeah. We should mention the er, the first speech at the beginning when mm-hmm. he's um, talking to his his prostitute, to Nola. Okay, hold on. Sure. I need to, okay, for all you millennials out there, I need to point out that Nola is played by Taryn Manning who plays this part beautifully. Yeah, I she's think. really good. It also reminded me of how good she is as an actress because she's so typecast as like, she's kind of like the trashy white girl in all of the movies of this era. I've seen her in other things and I can't remember what I yeah. saw her in. She was in Orange is the New Black. I really liked her in the movie. So Nola is a very important character. You know who else is in Orange is the New Black? Who? Captain Janeway. Oh yeah, that's right. Red, Yeah. <laughs> You didn't even see no, Orange is the New I pointed it out. I was like, what is Red doing in Star Trek? <laughs> yeah, I'm going through a Star Trek Voyager right now. <laughs> this episode is going to be about how white is Chim. <laughs> uh, anyway, so DJ has a conversation with Nola, who is the prostitute that he pimps. Yeah, so she's the main prostitute. Because yeah. there's also Taraji P. Henson, whose name is, I think, Shug. And she's pregnant. She's like six to like seven. You know, I never eight. understood that relationship. She was pregnant with, I guess, somebody else's baby. Well, they don't know. <laughs> yeah, they never they never set that up. Yeah. There's this great speech at the beginning between DJ and Nola. And he's talking about how a man is not a dog. A man has to decide. Mm-hmm. A dog can just lick his ass and, you know, get by in the world. Mm-hmm. But a man is aware of death. Mm-hmm. And he has to make decisions. Yeah. It's a nice setup. It's a nice bit of script writing because that's going to come b- become important later. First of all, he's trying to get out of that. And so is she. So mm-hmm. is Nola. Mm-hmm. I think what kind of binds them together is a similar arc that they're trying to do, mm-hmm. which is get out of their situation. Right. And for him, this is his way out. But then he reverts to, I guess, the animal. Mm-hmm. in what becomes the turning point of the film. Right. When he tries to give Ludacris uh, Skinny Black his his mixtape. Mm-hmm. By the way, that scene was set up so well. Again, I just want to marvel at Terrence Howard's This acting. is not a mixtape yet, by the way. It's a demo. Oh, it's a demo. Yeah, they're oh, calling okay, it Okay, so that's demo. what we used yeah, to call it, a demo. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. we used to call it a demo. So he's the whole movie, he's been trying to set up this meeting with Skinny Black mm-hmm. so that he can give him his demo. So they complete their demo, and I just thought it was wonderful, that scene. And I think I turned to you and I said, this is where things are going <laughs> to... Oh, yeah, totally. This is where something's going to happen. But it's, a, again, a fantastic bit of acting and filmmaking. He has to become the hustler. So he's mm-hmm. not just a rapper. He's not just a... You know, the movie's called Hustle and Flow. He has to hustle Skinny Black in a way. And Skinny Black is giving him shit and talking down to him. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like this Tarantino moment where DJ is going to have to turn the tables yep. in the dialogue mm-hmm. and turn it back to show him who's in command of this situation. Mm-hmm. And Skinny Black is surrounded by his posse. And it's just a beautiful turn when he says what you've been talking about earlier, mm-hmm. about his, how he was real before and how yeah. he's lost his way. They then bond, you know, they get drunk together, they smoke weed together. And then he goes to the bathroom and then he beautifully, he elegantly, he masterfully, he hustles in the most graceful way, slips him the demo tape. Mm -hmm. And he takes the demo tape and he puts it in his pocket. DJ goes into the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Skinny is passed out on the floor with his pants down, tries to help him up and sees that his demo tape is in the toilet. And then he loses it. And then he becomes the animal. Right. I guess that I've been talking about. Yeah. I don't know if this is kind of a fair way of I think so, yeah. I th- yeah. So he so he becomes he he gives in to his more base tendencies towards mm-hmm. violence. And and violence is implicit throughout the film, like you were talking about earlier. And then that's the change. He he undermines himself. Again, yeah. that tragic hero right. undermining himself. And I was wondering, you know, we've been talking about this idea on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Of what is the film about the person who strives to make it and doesn't? Mm-hmm. 
And I was wondering if it was going to go that way, if he was just going to go to jail and then that was it. I think that that was kind of it. But that's not what happens. So here's what happens yeah. in films a uh-huh. lot. Mm-hmm. You do a test screening and you see what the audience thinks. And if the audience doesn't like it, they'll reshoot Mm -hmm. and change the ending. Robert Altman made a movie called The Player, which is about this very thing. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if they test screen this and change the ending. Mm -hmm. Because in the middle of the dialogue where he's talking to him in prison, Mm -hmm. he says, but Nola has been hustling your tape. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it was all part of the screen. No, I think you're right. Because I really thought that this was... And I was like, wow, this is like a very realistic. It's a beautiful movie. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. that's what I was thinking too. He goes to jail and he pays for what he did. Uh-huh. And then it like this movie took a weird turn when it was mentioned that Nola was like hustling the demo, the CD and got him his song on the radio. I have to say that was a great moment. Yeah, it was. Yeah. That being said, in 2005, that was when the iPod came out. Yes, yeah. you're right. And you know what? Like that was the end of like selling CDs. <laughs> So Mm. it probably went on the radio, became a hit, and he probably didn't see any of that money. Oh, I don't know if I agree with you there. I I, I think so. I mean, that getting played on the radio, even before you have a record deal, if you're making noise with what's being played, and God, radio's gone now, Right. right? But that could lead to a deal. It could, but then like, it could also just like, there's so many like people who had like two hits on the radio Mm -hmm. and like went bankrupt. Oh sure, but yeah. that's but that's after getting the deal, I think. That's yeah, after getting the yeah, deal. but then also like even with the deal, like you don't see like that was a transition period, two thousand five. I feel like mm-hmm. two thousand five was a huge transition period for I think so, everybody. Too. Yeah. And now we know that artists aren't making money with like sales, right? Like, right. Record sales. That promise of digital mm-hmm. distribution, yeah. uh, very innocent in the early days. It didn't yeah. turn out that so way. So they tour, they sell merch and they, you know, do other deals and whatever, they get sponsored by you know whatever they have youtube channels and great but 2005 was that year that a lot of people got just fucked over Mm. and then they just lost the rights to their music because also the copy it wasn't even copyrighted so I yeah, think I thought about maybe... this as, as this was going on in the yeah. movie. I thought about like, well, I thought maybe you know you're wondering where this is going to go. I thought maybe Skinny was going to steal his shit. Yeah, I thought so too. And I thought now you're automatically, your copyright is automatically protected or whatever. Not that anybody can make any money off of it. But if you post it on like SoundCloud or Bandcamp, that itself protects you from like people stealing your Oh, yeah. Now everything's very legal. Yeah. But back then, we were getting advice like... You need to put the tape in an envelope and mail it to yourself and not open it. That's why you have like you have the post it postage date and that is later it can be proof that you had it oh, recorded. Weird. Yeah, okay. that was like the weirdest advice and it was like a very 2004 advice. Mm. But that's the era that we're talking about. Yeah. And this song was probably not copyrighted. It might have had some like, I don't know, illegal sampling shit. Mm-hmm. That they might have to like pay somebody for later. Well, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the music, we can talk about the music later, mm-hmm. but I don't know if you noticed there's a lot of guitar. There's oh, a yeah, lot of, yeah. you know, they didn't really get into that. That's true. Bass, like real bass, like great bass lines. Yeah. So it might, it, it's a triumph, but it's not like a. No, but he, so at the end of the movie, he wins. Yeah. Because he, yeah. because he sees the two prison guards. Yes, yes. They say, oh, that's your song. And then the ultimate victory for the hero Mm -hmm. is i've got one of the prison guards says i've got a demo will you just please give it a listen Mm -hmm. once you get to that point right you've made it Mm -hmm. so i I think that was the thing with the movie yeah yeah. um, because he'd been chasing that with skinny Mm -hmm. listen to my demo tape and then finally he has that turned over to him Mm -hmm. and then he said some takeaway lion and then Mm -hmm. that's the end of the movie movies about music let me just close out some of the things that I was trying to get at in terms yes, of his please. character, yeah. um, which is I'm trying to decide, is he a good person? Because, you know, the scene of him crying, he's authentically got something inside of him mm-hmm. that he wants to express. And that's a beautiful thing. And that is the artistic soul, right? Mm-hmm. He's also abusive to the women around him. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's a literal pimp. He's a literal pimp. He's very charming. He's Mm -hmm. a hustler. Yeah. He is a drug dealer. Yeah. I don't know. We could sort of go down the line, um, but he's a very charming guy. Yeah. He's a very manipulative guy. Uh And I don't know how to feel about his character. 
Well, I don't. Okay, so because let me just say this. Yeah. So he's the he's the protagonist. Skinny is the antagonist. To root for the protagonist, you have to not like the antagonist. The role of the antagonist is to upset the protagonist's process towards achieving what he wants to achieve. Okay, that's done. I just don't know. I guess if I'm being honest, I'm rooting for him because he feels genuine. Mm -hmm. I'm rooting for him because he's got this inside of him, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't seem to appreciate the musical process. Well, because he is an inherently, he's probably a narcissist. Okay. And a manipulative, abusive, he's a pimp. And I'm sorry, but like... (laughs) That probably says it right there. I mean, it's a genuine character. It is a genuinely, like he's a genuine, like, you know, I don't know when hustling got to have such a positive connotation but like that is hustling that is like you know a hustling is a lot of it is manipulation being charismatic and then there's also this theme of like at any cost right well there's the scene when he uses his prostitute to, so that he can buy a fucking microphone yeah, yeah. which was that was not right i i was surprised that this movie even dealt with like her perspective on that because, you know, a lot of movies back then I, wouldn't have. Yeah, I think yeah. they had to because yeah. they, with the protagonist, you have to like the protagonist or you have to right. want to be invested in their outcome. But even the way he slithered out of that situation when she was exactly. upset, that okay. felt very manipulative So this me. is the thing yeah. he did. He slithered out of doing a horrible thing. Yes. And that's the manipulation that I'm talking about. And that's a very unlikable trait. Yeah, totally. I mean, I know people like him. I've known people like him, especially in this industry. But, you know, that's kind of the personality profile of people in the music industry who are trying to make it in entertainment. It was a very familiar. And when you're younger, when I was younger, I was very easily manipulated by that, by these characters. You also want to believe what they're selling to you. So Nola was easily manipulated by DJ because she wanted something from him. And she says it. She's like, I want something. And he's like, what do you want? Tell me what you want. I don't know what it is. But she is willing to buy into his dream because she doesn't have a dream of her own. Right. And I think that is true for all of the women, all of these prostitutes Mm -hmm. in this story, including Taraji P. Henson's, uh, Taraji P. Henson's character, Shug, who's the pregnant Mm -hmm. one. She was great. She was fantastic. Yeah, she's fantastic. They work together a lot after this, I think. And Mm. they, they have great chemistry. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They look great together. And I think she's like genuinely in love with DJ. Yeah. And there's a character you can root for. Like every frame she's Mm -hmm. in, you're kind of rooting for her. Yeah. At one time, at one point, they bring her in to do the hook, to Mm -hmm. do the chorus. And um, they ask her to sing this line that DJ's written. And here he is manipulating again, but Mm -hmm. in a good way. He's like, no bring it and then she really brings it yeah and she's so good like that is the exact vocal um direction that hip-hop producers give you Mm -hmm. and she does it it's Mm -hmm. like it's kind of like you kind of sound like a whore yeah because she yeah yeah, so her third take (laughs) it's hard like being a no it's like no but it's like she's strong but then the ends of the phrases are kind of like yeah sing sing the phrase (laughs) i can't come on so ridiculous sing it so it's like here I am manipulating. Come on, bring it, bring it. <laughs> so it's like it's hard out here for a pimp. That, that's like, it. <laughs> that's it. So it's that. It's that pimp. Yeah, pimp. Like yeah. you know, it's, it's like you sound, and that is the exact vocal direction that mm-hmm. they always give you. I've I done thinking, so many of these. I was thinking yeah. about this while I was watching. It's like, oh yeah, that is like the uh, hip hop girl totally. vocal part. But then she hears herself in the headphones, mm-hmm. and she's so happy. I know it's yeah. such a great moment. Yeah. And I, I know that feeling too, but she is the ultimate like manipulatee, right? Like, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, she is. I, I mean, to she's going to be, it, right. he's going to use her so badly. Totally. And I was like, oh man. And that is the reality of a lot of women in those kind of situations. Mm. And that was portrayed. I mean, I, I was heartbroken for both of them. I saw this in a very different light, especially Nola. I was heartbroken. Uh, she's a heartbreaking character. Yeah, so it's I... nice to see her take charge at the end. Mm-hmm. Just a, a minor thing that I really liked about mm-hmm. this movie that I want to say from a geeky filmmaking perspective. They have the fan on because it's so hot. It's yeah. Memphis and everybody's sweating constantly throughout this movie. 
and they have a hard, you know one of those box fans mm-hmm. you know in the room mm-hmm. and nola's job at first is just to turn the fan on and mm-hmm. off but there was just a great thing where he says the engineer says turn the fan off mm-hmm. and then she turns the fan and they did this a couple of times mm-hmm. and then you hear the fan kind of whir down mm-hmm. and then it goes to complete silence and I just like that because, first of all, you have to do that when you're recording. Mm-hmm. Like just a minute ago, I was asking you if we need to unplug the refrigerator. But what it did is it created this tension, like this this kind of, okay, now something's going to happen. Yeah. It, it was just a really nice little bit of filmmaking there. Yeah, it was. I felt like this was a pretty surprisingly good movie. I mean, it was It was like, a really good movie. It's I, an MTV movie, so I expected nothing from right. this. Yeah. So we should talk about that because um, this is also, I think MTV was, you know, of course, we all know MTV. It started off doing music videos. You know, I used to babysit and watch, you know, Michael Jackson videos and MTV. Well, interesting enough, back then, there were complaints that there wasn't enough black music on MTV. That was a big complaint. Yeah, yeah. Because they were doing a lot of these, what they call haircut bands, modern rock and all that kind of stuff. But then MTV started getting into, like, the real world and documentaries, and it stopped playing music. And it started producing films. Mm -hmm. I don't know what happened with MTV, but this is a very MTV movie. So when I saw the MTV logo Mm -hmm. right there at the beginning, I was like, okay, and then you saw the filmmaking. It was very saturated, very mm. high contrast lighting, kind of like how MTV music videos were at the time. Mm-hmm. Very aggressive type of colors. I don't know. It was just a very MTV movie because by that time, hip hop, MTV was really promoting hip hop culture. Yeah, I think this was like the peak. Because I remember when hip hop died down at the clubs. When did that happen? I would say that it happened around 2007, when all of a sudden they were not playing this music at the clubs anymore. They still play hip hop at certain clubs, but like the very mainstream parties, the clubs, there was like a... I guess not house music, but like sort of techno kind of thing happened. That's true. Yeah. And I think black music started moving into more like Alicia Keys and um, back to almost like soul influences. Yeah, that, that could be kind of true too. Yeah. And hip hop still kind of exists, but it mellowed out definitely during this era. Mm. And that's why we have like Drake now, you know, it mellowed out to the point. God, I listened to a Drake song. Yeah. What, he had a new song that came out right coincidentally at the uh, beginning of the NBA preseason. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And coincidentally you heard enough. It and, you were and I heard the song. I'd never heard a Drake song before. And I was horrified. Yeah. I thought it was just the stupidest thing I'd ever heard in my yeah, life. Yeah. I mean, there's still good hip hop out there. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of like Kendrick and J. Cole. And, you know, like I'm aware of like the... Under- but a lot of the kids are listening to like really stupid ass hip hop. And I'm just like... It's the result of like this mellowing out of not that any of this crunk stuff was cool either. This It was very cheesy. It was very weird. But then at least like you could dance to it. Well, I wonder when the auto tune started taking over too. 2007. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember like T-Pain started coming out in the clubs like incessantly. And that was sort of like the end of me going out to clubs. I we, was like, I'm done with this shit. We watched a documentary on that too, yeah. on, on um, auto tune and rap music. And yeah. It's it's terrible. Yeah, and I remember there was this Soldier Boy thing. I like, don't even know what you're talking okay, about. Okay, so I this because this was the last time I Soldier went to a club. Boy. Yeah, I went out to the club, and then I was like, what, 24, 23, 24? And they started doing, collectively doing this like Soldier Boy dance, right? Like it was like they were all dancing. You don't have to. Dancing like soldiers? No, 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 no. Dodo, don't comment. Okay, I'm just, <laughs> yeah, just... Don't say anything while I tell this story. Everybody else will know what I'm talking about. You have the floor. (laughs) And that was sort of like the end of rap for me. I was like, I'm done with this. That was the end of going out and dancing to hip hop. And, And then I went to a party in New York in 2016. And the kids, the cool kids, like the Gen Z kids were listening to really old school stuff. Like they were dancing to like 80s. Yeah, that's what's happening now. Like these cool Brooklyn kids, they hate The Weeknd, they hate Drake, they don't listen to that. So it's like, oh, okay, so you know that you're shit, like your music is shit. So then who's listening to it? How is it selling all these copies? I think like younger kids, kids who are not cool. uh, No, I'm guessing it's probably like... (laughs) 
think it's 32 Asian year olds. Kids. Oh, maybe Asian. Yeah, you're right. It's Asian kids. Yeah. I think you're right. I still want to know what a soldier boy dance is. You can look it up later. Can you do it for me? No, I can't. I, that's what I'm saying. Like, I was, I refused to do it. Because I imagine, like, people dressed as soldiers dancing. No, it has lockstep. nothing to do with soldiers. The rapper's name was Soldier Boy. Oh, I gotcha. Yeah. And the the song, I think, was Superman. Like, it wasn't even, had nothing to do with, like, soldiers. And then later after this came the Harlem Shake and then the Dougie, you know? So they were these, like, before there was TikTok, there was Vine. And there were, like, these 10 to 15 second videos. And so th- these sort of... Oh, so I it was did the hear beginning. about this. Yeah, yes. it was the beginning. That was, it was an utter failure. Vine was an utter totally. failure. Totally. And then it was also the beginning of, like, collective dancing at office parties. And that's when I was like... Like I'm, flash I'm mobs? Out. Yeah. Not, no, they're different from flash mobs, but it's like these Vine videos of like fucking office party people dancing to hip hop, like doing the Dougie or whatever. And then like the Obama administration, oh, Michelle Obama did the Dougie on TV. And I was like, this is okay. Hip hop is no longer like urban or young anymore. I'm so out of it. But it was sort of like the death of this music for me, like mainstream. All this to say that this era was the peak and sort of like the beginning of the end you were talking about your man crush on T- Terrence Howard. Yeah. What well, you liked his performance, right? I thought movie. he was fantastic yeah, in this what, movie. Yeah, what about it? I thought he had total command of his character. Mm-hmm. His character was completely consistent. Mm-hmm. I kind of want to know his background. Maybe he is like a like He's a, always like the good-looking bad guy, isn't he? I yeah, know, I, I guess I don't know. I just thought he had total command over this and he was a complicated character he is, and I yeah. like complicated characters. Yeah. So he obviously had passion in him. Mhm. He had drive in him. And another thing that I've never liked with hip hop culture, again, is this excessive masculinity. Mm -hmm. And he embodies that as well. Right. That's not why I have a man crush on him. Mm -hmm. I I, I am in awe of his talent and Mm -hmm. his good looks. And both are on display in this movie. I think he's a highly skilled actor. Yeah, I I noticed that in this movie too. Yeah, and he just owned it. And you could see the complexity. And there's just, I forget who said it, but some cinematographer from the 1940s said, cinematography is a play of the eyes. Mm -hmm. It's, It's eyes. It's where is the character looking at? What is the character thinking about? Gilles Deleuze calls it the affect image, Mm -hmm. the the person who's being affected Mm -hmm. by what's going on around. Uh, Rather than showing what's happening, we see the character reacting to what's happening. Mm -hmm. He's got that look. Yeah. He's a powerful actor. He is. And I thought he was perfectly cast for this. I wondered how much of him was like Gary Oldman in True Romance. Gary Oldman was in True Romance? Oh, it's his best performance. Really? In history. He even says, if you talk to Gary Oldman, he says, yeah, that was probably... You know, there were so many famous He was a white Rastafarian... Oh my God, I totally remember him now. Yeah. And he, he was dressed in a robe. That was Gary And he Oldman. talked in, a, in black speak. Oh, my God. I didn't even know. I didn't even remember him. But now I, it's ringing a bell. Gary Oldman obviously is far outside of himself in doing that mm-hmm. role. And he nails it. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder, you know, it makes, me, it makes me curious about his other roles. Because I can't really think of too many Terrence Howard roles, actually. Yeah, but I don't think it's as far as Gary Oldman in yeah, true that's, romance. That's yeah, about as far as an actor can as, get, yeah. I think. <laughs> Any other thoughts? My closing comment for this podcast, this episode, would be that this movie is definitely very much a product of its time. And I know that everything Y2K and early 2000s is kind of back now, unfortunately, um, to my dismay and horror. Um, If you want to get a very accurate you know, portrayal of what went, like how music, this type of music was made. This, I think, is a pretty good movie that portrayed it. The portrayal of the music was very well done. Mm-hmm. And I love the idea of them like stapling cup the, cartons yeah. to the walls in order yeah. to deaden the, the room. Oh, yeah. You mentioned that he was standing too high for the microphone. Right. And you're right, but I think that was to show his face. Totally. The, I realized that as yeah. I was watching the scene. It's always nice. And this is kind of the spirit of our podcast, I think, is how is music represented in, in movies. And, and it's it's a really good look at hip hop and, and the creation mm-hmm. of music. Yeah, I really enjoyed the movie. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, me too. You know, it's kind of, again, a complicated character. I'm not sure how to feel about him, but just a magnetic performance. Mm-hmm. Great performances all around mm-hmm. and an interesting movie about music. 
All right, then. All right. What are we doing next? There's two movies that Cece and I discussed when we were talking about, hey, maybe we should do a podcast. And one of them is the movie that we're going to watch next. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is... Whiplash. Whiplash. So that'll be next episode, and that will be, I think, a very interesting episode. Yes. Okay, everybody. Catch you next time. Yeah. Bye-bye. Under the moonlight, I'll sing you a song. So you'd magically feel a love that's alone. Hopefully, they'll live eternally. If we paint ourselves all bright with stories of heroes and poets and sadness and war, of immeasurable pain, unconditional love. Movies about music